on World News Tonight. Japan in mourning. Former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is paid respects in a state funeral amidst polarizing displays of protests. Looming threats. Hurricanes litter the planet, leaving behind a path of destruction, with mass evacuations leaving people fearing for their homes. Making history. Planetary defense technology takes a leap forward with the successful collision of NASA's DART project. And Expo City. Dubai unveils plans of building a marvel of innovation on the blueprint of an already successful project. This is Other There in a World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. As we join you tonight, Japan is in mourning with the state funeral of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe just having been carried out today. The venue was saturated with global leaders paying their final respects. However, the event did not go without oppositions as protests were frequent. We have other there in the World News special correspondent Rasit Chandra Dasa joining us now from Tokyo in Japan. Rasit. Good evening, Anurag. Today is a big day for Japan and Japanese people people. Uh, their ex-Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who was unfortunately assassinated in Nara a couple of months ago, had his state funeral at the uh, Nippon Budokan starting from 2 p.m. local time. Before that, the gates were open to the general public from 9.30 in the morning and we saw massive number of people queuing up to offer their last respect to the, to the slain leader. Uh, when the official state funeral started at 2 p.m., we saw hundreds of foreign dignitaries uh, such as the US Vice President Kamala Harris, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, as well as the Singaporean Prime Minister, leader of Vietnam, uh, to say so few. And also our own Ranil Vikram Singh, the President, was also in attendance. Uh, it is said that nearly 4,000 local and foreign dignitaries participated in the events. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida started with his official address and also ex-Prime Minister Suga Yoshide represented Abe-san's friends and his faction and gave a very uh, moving speech. Abe-san, although he's well known, probably the most widely known Japanese Prime Minister outside of Japan, is a bit of controversial figure inside Japan. To emphasize that, uh, the service taken even yesterday shows that more than 50% of the people opposed the state funeral. And there are the, the, the reasons vary. Some say the cost, which is put around 20, uh, 15 to 20 million US dollars, is very high. Some say his legacy is controversial. And the people might wonder why such a guy has a, who had the longest tenure is controversial. Yes, Abe San was a highly successful prime minister. He led his party, the LDP, into five or six multiple election victories, which is unheard in post war Japan. But he also took Japan and his party to the right extreme. For example, his policies on the defense. Uh, he took Japan and their self-defense forces. He wanted to make them a full capable army. And he, Abe-san also want to, wanted to uh, create a new constitution for the Japan, for that more than 50% of Japanese people opposed. To show that there were few, over 15,000 people gathered outside of the parliament today to oppose the state funeral, as well as few thousand people gathered outside of the Japan, the Nippon Budokan, when the event was having to oppose, to show their stance against the state funeral. So, with the state funeral over, I'm pretty sure lots of foreign dignities they will get back to their the actual roles, like they would have meetings with uh, Japanese uh, ministers as well as mainly with uh, Prime Minister Kishida. And our own Ronald Vikram Singh, the president, had a meeting with foreign minister today, Hayashi-san, and he expected to meet uh, Kishida as well. And he's also have, going to have a meeting with the Japanese parliamentarian over a breakfast tomorrow morning. And that meeting is very important because that would represent not just the ruling LDP, it also it will represent the opposition party as well. So it's a good chance for the president uh, to express and to sell himself and our country to show all the situation and get whatever help he needs. Over to you, Anwar. Thank you. All right, thank you. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Rasis Chandra Dasa reporting from Tokyo in Japan.
Russia is erupting in bouts of lethal gunfire and protests as President Putin's plans of more military drafts to Ukraine meets with heavy backlash, both from the people of his nation and also from international figureheads. Today in eastern Russia, terror. A man opens fire at the military enlistment office as everyone else runs for it. One officer injured, the suspect under arrest. According to local media reports, the suspect was shouting, no one will go to fight. Troubling signs, the response to Russian President Putin's order sending reservists to the front lines is growing violent. The attack following a rare weekend of protest from St. Petersburg with some demonstrators struck by police to Dagestan where gunfire went off within the crowd. Thousands risked arrest to rail against mobilization, as many more dodge the draft any way they can. Lines of cars to cross the border into Finland and Georgia, traffic jams extending for miles, though others are reporting to draft offices. This man saying his mother was unhappy, but what can he do? We have to defend our country. But in Russian-occupied areas of Ukraine tonight, some say young men of draft age are now going missing. Zainish Hussein fled the eastern city of Kherson three weeks ago. They go missing, right? Like, they just drag them out of their homes and take them somewhere. That claim as Russia is poised to annex occupied areas once the controversial referendum to join Russia that critics call a sham election is over toward the end of the week. Large-scale evacuations have thousands scrambling for essential supplies as all of Florida falls under a state of emergency, anticipating the hurricane-turned-tropical storm Ian to cause mass destruction. Tonight, Floridians on the move, hoping to avoid disaster after mandatory evacuations were issued in multiple counties for hundreds of thousands of people. We did not make this decision easily, but this storm poses a serious threat and we must do everything we can to protect our residents. The call coming as Tampa projects to see double-digit storm surge and 100 mile an hour plus sustained winds. Florida challenged by an aging population with less mobility. We ask that our long-term care facilities begin their evacuations today. We're already seeing some of our hospitals do that. Some that's families now enough. making the decision to hit the road. I don't know how, how good of a job that's going to do. Anna Griggs it's is worse. evacuating to a hotel. So, okay. You want some help? No, I'm fine. Okay. The mother of two teenagers lives blocks from the bay. They're not sure what they'll even return to. Supplies are in high demand. Residents waiting in lines for hours for sandbags. And water supplies running thin. I just got here and it's been a... It's saying that there's no water here. Challenge is all unfolding with a storm whose wrath has yet to be fully felt. Typhoon Noru is wreaking havoc through the Philippines as well. The strong gusts that made landfall on one of the islands have already been reported to have caused casualties. Entire towns underwater in the northern part of the Philippines. After the strongest storm to hit the country this year, Typhoon Noru, made landfall on Sunday. Fierce winds swept across the main island of Luzon, causing floods and power outages. In the town of San Miguel, just 80 kilometers north of the capital, Manila, many residents have been left with nothing, desperately in need of aid. This is the worst flooding that has happened here in San Miguel. My house has two levels, and the water reached the second floor. Even our local market is completely submerged. The water is waist deep in the streets and inside my house. Our belongings are also underwater and destroyed. The people here need help, like food, water and medicine. But the devastation has not been as widespread as many had feared. More than 75,000 people were evacuated from their homes before the storm hit, a precaution which, according to the government, saved many lives. May have gotten lucky at least this time, a little bit. Uh, but I think uh, the, it's clear from uh, this, uh, from what we did this last two days, is that uh, very, very important is preparation. Uh, get people out of the areas of danger. The Philippines is one of the most vulnerable nations to the impacts of climate change and is hit by an average of 20 storms per year. 
Amid growing concerns for an unstable economy, Italy's first ever female prime minister prepares to take office with a far-right-led government which would also be the first of its kind since the Second World War. Tonight, Italy is preparing for its first ever female prime minister and its first leader from the far right since the Second World War. Giorgia Meloni's Brothers of Italy party winning the most votes in this weekend's election. Now she's poised to form and lead a right-wing coalition government. Non siamo un punto d'arrivo. Non siamo un punto di partenza. Meloni's party has ideological roots in Italy's neo-fascist movement, a movement that gained traction after dictator Benito Mussolini. <laughs> Her agenda, drawing criticism. Among her flagship policies, a naval blockade to stop the arrival of immigrants and refugees, who she says are bringing crime and poverty to Italy. Opponents have warned she's a threat to democracy, a charge she strongly denies. Four days I uh, have been reading articles in the international press about the upcoming elections that will give Italy a new government in which I am described as a danger to democracy, uh, to Italian, European and international stability. For the leaders of Italy's centre-left, a resounding defeat. Oggi è un giorno triste per l'Italia, per l'Europa, ci aspettano giorni duri. But after years of political chaos, many Italians are just looking for stability, whether it comes from the left or the right. I don't like her, but she's what Italians need, says this voter. Meloni's win is the latest in a string of election victories for the hard right across Europe. In Sweden, a far-right party is now the second largest in Parliament. And in France, ultra-nationalists won 11 times as many seats as they did five years ago. Meloni has pledged to continue NATO's policy of supporting Ukraine. But some of her right-wing coalition partners, including former Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi, have made comments sympathetic to Putin. A time of uncertainty in Europe, only deepening with the rise of a new far-right leader. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. While addressing the 77th UN General Assembly in New York, North Korea's permanent representative to the UN blamed the US for growing hostilities in the region. This was following yet another ballistic missiles test carried out by North Korea. North Korea has slammed the U.S. for escalating tensions on the Korean Peninsula with its joint military drills with Seoul. Obviously, this is an extremely dangerous act of igniting the fuse to drive the situation on the Korean Peninsula to the brink of war. The remarks were made by the North's ambassador to the U.N. at the U.N. General Assembly on Monday, a day after the regime fired a ballistic missile towards the sea off its east coast. Kim Sang also stressed that North Korea is caught in a vicious cycle of tension and confrontation due to the U.S.'s growing hostility toward the regime. Kim also strongly criticized what he called, quote, U.S.-centered international order. The rules-based international order advocated by the U.S. is no less than a U.S.-centered international order permeated with unilateral and hegemonic American values. He then went on to explain that the regime rejects UN resolutions as an infringement of its sovereign right to self-defense and space exploration. He elaborated that the North has never recognized such resolutions that were made unilaterally by the U.S. While Kim did not touch upon South Korea during his speech that lasted for about 20 minutes, he did praise the regime for programs that ended the COVID-19 pandemic in North Korea in some 100 days. NASA's DART has successfully made an impact with the target asteroid Dimorphos. The results of this mission will define the future of planetary defense systems to protect against any future threats. Oh my goodness. Traveling at 14,000 miles per hour, NASA's DART spacecraft in time lapse tonight. It's final seconds before slamming into a harmless asteroid named Dimorphos, orbiting a bigger asteroid 7 million miles away. In typical NASA precision, Bullseyes. Woo! Fantastic. NASA's goal to slam Dart into Dimorphos and nudge it slightly off course. 
For the first time, humanity has demonstrated the ability to autonomously target and alter the orbit of a celestial object. It'll take a week or more before NASA can analyze data from telescopes on Earth and in space to tell if DART successfully gave Dimorphos a tiny push, a critical test if NASA hopes to use the same technique to one day divert a mega asteroid from hitting Earth. But potentially a real-life threat to the global population, NASA Chief Bill Nelson. It may be the clue of what we could do in the future to try to save life here on Earth. NASA says it does not see any asteroid posing an imminent threat to Earth. But in 2013, a massive meteor escaped detection and exploded over a remote Russian village, injuring 1,500 people. Impacts from asteroids have had a profound effect on the history of life on Earth. You know, you can ask the dinosaurs about that. International arrivals and travelers now can forego the cumbersome quarantine process in Hong Kong. The city is expecting the fresh influx of people will provide a much-needed boost to its economy. Hong Kong is readying for a surge in travel as it ends mandatory COVID-19 hotel quarantine for the first time in more than two and a half years. Travel companies reported a tenfold jump in requests. The global financial hub's leader, John Lee, said on Friday that international arrivals could return home or seek accommodation of their choice, but had to monitor for three days on entry. 58-year-old Hong Kong resident Barbara Van Mops was so excited by the news she changed her flights so she could arrive back in Hong Kong on the day the restrictions lifted. I think the rest of the world has opened up and so Hong Kong was you know, falling, falling behind, and I think it just needs to open up now and return to normal because it's such a fantastic place to live. Travel website Expedia Hong Kong said searches for Japan surged 10 times on the news, while those for Taiwan almost doubled over the prior 14 days. Trip.com said flight searches surged 95 times and orders sought 50% on its Hong Kong site on the week, with Tokyo, Bangkok, Osaka and Singapore featuring as top destinations. Monday's change, though, still leaves Hong Kong far behind much of the world in dropping curbs. International arrivals remain barred from bars and restaurants for three days. Although allowed to go to work and school, they still need to do multiple COVID tests in the first week after arriving. Still, Hong Kong's Travel Industry Council expects rebound travel to surge as much as 50% for the next few months its executive director told public broadcaster RTHK, but adding that growth would be capped by the number of outbound flights, while inbound tourism was not likely to grow much, inhibited by the existing restrictions. Venezuela and Colombia reopened their borders to vehicles transporting goods following seven years of partial closure, including three years in which it was fully closed due to a political spat. A symbol of hope and new beginnings. For the first time in seven years, border crossings fully resumed along this bridge linking Colombia and Venezuela. Today is a historic day for the region, for the country, South America and the entire continent. Globalization is first and foremost a relationship between neighbors. It isn't just a bridge of cement, it's also a roadmap for how all surrounding regions can develop economically. Trade between the two countries was worth over 7 billion euros in 2008, but in 2015 Caracas accused Colombian armed groups of attacking Venezuelan soldiers and closed the bridge. Some trade restarted, but the relationship soured further after Venezuela's 2018 elections. Bogota recognized opposition leader Juan Guaido as Venezuela's legitimate leader and President Nicolas Maduro accused Colombia of attempting a coup. The two countries cut off diplomatic ties in 2019. Colombian President Gustavo Petro has been in office for just over a month and renewing links with Caracas was one of his campaign pledges. That's part of a wider push to strengthen economic links across South America. I think it will improve the situation of both countries because it will boost trade and create more employment opportunities on both sides. Pedestrians have already been able to cross the border, among them Venezuelans who get vital supplies in Colombia amid chronic food and medicine shortages in their own country.
Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Britain's Royal Mail unveiled four new stamps in commemoration of late monarch Queen Elizabeth II. All four stamps feature images that were previously used in the 2002 stamp issue, which marked the Queen's Golden Jubilee. South Korea saw the largest number of deaths in 2021 since related data was first compiled almost 40 years ago. The three leading causes of death were cancer, heart disease and pneumonia, which made up nearly half of the total deaths. Wall Street plunged as a slumping British pound, a sharp rise in US government bond yields and a strengthening US dollar spooked investors. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. In case you missed any of the programs you watched tonight, you can rewatch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other there in English. We're leaving you tonight with a glimpse into Dubai City of the Future, a playground of innovation constructed on the foundations of Expo Dubai. Thank you for joining us. Good night. <laughs>